And we're going to bring two members of our France 24 team in now to help explain some more context with this story. First, we have Douglas Herbert here, our international affairs Hi, commentator. Uh, and on my right, Shirley Sitbon from our science desk to help break down a little more about the science behind what happened here and why the destruction was so bad. But Doug, let's start with you. Um, you know, we just got an idea from that package and Jasper as to yeah. the destruction here and what teams are doing on the ground, but there are some obstacles that are unique to this region as well. Can you explain the wider political issues at work here. Absolutely. And it's always, you know, it, it's tragic enough when you have a devastating earthquake hit a region, but it's even more tragic when you have messy geopolitics uh, sort of uh, getting in the way of, like you said, rest search and rescue efforts, and even raising questions of who is going to provide humanitarian aid for whom in which areas. Uh, remember, yes, we're talking a lot about the, 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 the earthquake was centered, the epicenter was in south central, southeastern Turkey. That's true. And there's been devastating uh, damage there and, and destruction. But there's also the portion of northern Syria, specifically northwestern Syria, bordering Turkey as well. Remember, earthquakes, fault lines, they don't know uh, national borders. It continues right across. So the region, really, which has been most devastatingly affected by these back-to-back -back quakes, because remember, we're not talking about an aftershock. We're talking about a major quake first earlier this morning, followed by a second major quake very nearby, affected by the same fault line. This region has been racked by over a decade of civil war in Syria. So in Turkey's case, racked by the fact that you've had 3.6 million Syrian refugees pouring into Turkey, a lot of them are based in that south central region and specifically around the city of Gaziantep, which was at the epicenter of this quake. So you have about half a million Syrian refugees living in these so-called container camps, these cities, literally containers uh, there. And in the Syrian case, you have you have hundreds of thousands of displaced, that's the word for it, and refugees, displaced uh, Syrians who've had to move up into that area. It's now controlled. It's a rebel enclave. The last Turkish opposition-controlled enclave holding out against the Assad government. Assad controls all the rest of Syria. This is a bastion that is not under the control of the Assad government. What you have are these hundreds of thousands of refugees, often people who've already lived under bombardment and airstrikes for years and years. And here you have an earthquake coming on top of all of that. So it's been called sort of an emergency on top of an emergency. It was bad enough before you had a devastating earthquake. But now, what do you do with these people who've been living in sometimes already housing and infrastructure that was on the verge of collapse, either because it's been hit by missiles and airstrikes, bombarded, already made fragile, and now you have this earthquake. So in this case, you have a lot of people displaced outside buildings, living in makeshift camps already. How do you get humanitarian aid to them? Who's going to send it to them? Assad, Bashar Assad's government, you can almost bet is not going to be sending uh, and thinking too much of the the rebels, uh, uh, the, this rebel enclave and the people who live in it. This is a lost cause for Assad right now. He's not helping those people. He will keep his money and his resources focused on the places in Syria, government-controlled Syria that were affected, whether the port of Latakia, whether Hama, um, and so on, or, or Aleppo, and so on and so forth. Not this area. So will the West help this area? How will they get the aid in? Remember, it's surrounded by. Uh, government controlled but Russian backed troops. So let's make it even a little more complicated here. A lot of the aid, when we're talking about the US aid, the European Union aid, sending search and rescue teams, it's right now being focused on Turkey. They're sending it to Turkey. We're not hearing as much about what's going to be happening in northwest Syria, which could be sort of, you know, the forgotten part of this equation here, with the hundreds of thousands of people, like I said, already in desperate, dire, vulnerable, exposed situations, now even more exposed today. Right. We were talking about this uh, earlier, about how we are having to give these numbers separately, but Turkey right. and Syria, just because of the communication. We're getting more communication from Turkey right. and the government. There's exactly. more organization than in Syria. Exactly. But you're right. This is... Uh, and and I'll just point out, we have the White Helmets organization, which is a humanitarian sort of ad hoc rescue organization that helps the refugees in this region. The White Helmets have been pleading with the world. They've been desperate. They say, we obviously don't have the resources here. International community, now's the time. We need everything you could throw, throw at us. We need everything in the kitchen sink, basically. Uh, so it's that's how dire the situation is. And you're right, because information, it's hard to communicate with this area. It's hard to get information out. But let's not forget, we're talking about, you know, upwards now, uh, estimates of about a thousand or more uh, in Turkey that have been confirmed as ca as killed by this earthquake, you can bet that in northwest Syria right now you have 
hundreds and hundreds, and the, and the death toll is likely to mount, the same way we've been seeing in Turkey. So if you really want to put it together, it's a much higher death toll, but we do tend to right now be having these numbers given to us separately. Mm -hmm. And we should be speaking with a member of the White Helmets in the next hour as well, so hopefully we can Great. get some more information from him on the ground. Uh, I want to cross now to Shirley Sitbon from our science desk to explain a little bit more about why this happened here and why it was so destructive. Let's start with just why Turkey's hit so often by earthquakes in general. Well, because of its uh, geographical and also the geological situation there, uh, let's look at some images, some file footage, archives, because this has happened so many times before. Uh, before this earthquake, the last deadliest one was in 1999 in Izmir. 17,000 people were killed, and these are some images from those days. But the deadliest on record was in uh, 1939, and 33,000 people were killed. And uh, we should say that this is not, it's not the actual uh, tremor that kills people, it's the collapse of buildings. Uh, we'll talk about that a, a bit later, but let's look at the geographic situation, the geographical situation of Turkey, where it's located. It's located on a plate, a tectonic plate that is called the uh, Anatolian plate, and it's actually uh, sandwiched, it's stuck between several other plates, three other plates. It's being pushed uh, upwards uh, by the Arabian plate, but it's stuck in the north, by the Eurasian uh, plate, the Eurasian plate. So it's, then it slides to the west, but then there's the, Ura the uh, African plate. So it's basically that's, there are several fault lines that cross uh, Turkey, which makes it such a vulnerable area. Uh, that's what we're seeing again and again. It's a known situation. Experts have been saying this for years. We have to get ready because this will happen again. And there are other earthquakes that are expected to happen in years to come. We can't know exactly when, but in the next decade or two decades, something, another major earthquake is likely to take place. That's what experts have been saying, so Turkey needs to get ready. Mm -hmm. And of course, Shirley, every time there is an earthquake, every time we see the destruction of this level, there is rebuilding that happens. Is that rebuilding being undertaken with planning for the next big earthquake? Well, apparently, no. Uh, that's the simple way of saying it. That's what engineers and architects have been saying. They've been shouting and calling for help. They've been saying the situation is dramatic because more than 60% of Turkey is uh, c can face earthquakes. And about 90% of the buildings there are not uh, earthquake-proof buildings. Uh, uh, you know that uh, a normal building, uh, most buildings in Turkey, they can take forces, uh, vertical forces, coming from their weight and uh, also from, from the ground. Uh, and they, what happens with an earthquake, a tremor, is that they get side-to-side -side forces and they're being pushed side-to-side. -side. And the bottom of the building and the top of the building, they're moving, moving differently. So this causes a collapse of the building eventually, not all of them, but when they do collapse, that what hap that's what happens. Well, uh, in recent decades, uh, countries and engineer experts, they've, been put, they've put in place uh, rules that allow buildings to, you know, to handle all of those forces, all of that stress coming from all directions. Uh, this means it really depends on the ground where it's built, the local situation, and there are various uh, materials they can use, there are various procedures, various techniques. It varies from one building to another, but this has not been followed and respected in Turkey, although they have the best engineers and architects in the world, they know this, but um, they wanted to build maybe very fast some buildings, and there's a way of, there's, there are penalties. If somebody builds a building and they don't respect the rules, then they just pay a penalty. And engineers have been saying, you have to change that law that cannot uh, we cannot continue this way because this generates catastrophes mm -hmm. so everything really needs to be rethought mm -hmm. no, and, I mean we're seeing from the images the level of destruction and these buildings just completely collapsed in on themselves so what happens in terms of the rescue work what needs to be done quickly first just to try to save as many lives as possible well sending as many rescue workers as possible and as many experts as possible. Uh, we can see some images of what happened, what happened uh, this morning when a rescue operation was taking place. Well, this would ha what happened was that a building collapsed at the same time. So they need to act very fast. Every minute counts, but they also need to do this in um, safe situations. Engineers, architects have been flying over to the, to the area to, to make sure buildings 
which have not collapsed are safe and will not collapse in hours to come. Uh, that way no other catastrophes happen. They also have to locate the areas under the rubble where people are still alive and waiting to be saved. This also, because time uh, is, is rushing, the clock is ticking. So really, engineers and architects have been flying in from across the world, across Turkey, but across the world, to locate the, the victims stranded beneath the rubble and trying to save them as fast as possible. I know, Doug, we know any time that there's international aid, lots of money, lots of offers from help coming from yeah. everywhere, from Israel to Russia to the United States, that there's going to be some difficulties, challenges with not only getting those people there, but then what happens with all the money? Who gets the money? Uh, I mean, from historically looking at when this has happened, not just in, in Turkey or in Syria, I mean, what are some of the challenges and obstacles that aid groups are going to run into. Everything you just mentioned. Uh, it's the monitoring, it's the verification, knowing that the money is going to get where the money needs to be get and not be siphoned off and and, and misappropriated, <laughs> to put it mildly, uh, by uh, corrupt and venal public officials. Uh, look, these are areas, like I said, I was saying before, this was an emergency on top of an emergency in the sense that you literally have this right in an area of civil war. These are areas, look, the rebel enclave of Syria, uh, you can imagine that, uh, you know, this, the state of, of institutions right now in governance is, is not rock solid right now. This is, you know, uh, this is uh, an enclave within a country that's been devastated and destroyed by, by, by Bashar Assad's war. And this is an enclave within that destruction, which is perhaps even harder hit than the rest of the country. Um, so, you know, rooting out corruption is probably the last thing uh, on, on most people's minds. And in Turkey itself, look, this comes amid a massive economic crisis in the country. You know, we don't, you, you, you know it's, it's easy to miss sight of an economic crisis when you're talking about a tragedy like a 7.8 magnitude earthquake. But the fact of the matter is, we've seen what's happened. You know, the average Turkish worker right now, and, and this is a poorer part of the country where, the, where this quake is hit, it's about 300, the equivalent of 300 US dollars a month that they're making, you know, a little less than euros. Um, and you have a lot of people literally struggling in Turkey now, uh, despite, you know, Erdogan trying to throw largesse at, the, at them in, in the run-up to the presidential election, struggling to buy food and rent. So it's this economic crisis which also breeds extra corruption. Uh, and into that breach, obviously, is this problem of getting the relief to the people you need. Local governmental control, it's very, very difficult. There's no easy answer to that. Um, right now, like I said, the, the immediate e effort and what the European Union is doing right now is dispatching the search and rescue teams. So there's 10 countries within the EU right now which have immediately agreed to start sending those people there to help the beleaguered uh, Turkish uh, and in northwest Syria, uh, the, the Syrian rescue, search and rescue workers to get through that rebel, which we were hearing Jasper earlier talk about what a painstaking process is. It could take days. In rare cases, it's drawn out a, a week or more um, and, and in the search for survivors. So, yeah, getting the money there is extremely difficult, and especially right now in this situation, like I said, of economic malaise, economic crisis, and rampant corruption. Mm -hmm. And maybe either of you could could help me with this next question. But once we're past the initial finding people in the rubble, trying to just get rid of all of the infrastructure that has been completely destroyed, I mean, are we looking at potentially disease? I mean, Doug touched on hunger. Like, what are some of the longer term uh, challenges here for rebuilding in this area? Yes, like every uh, catastrophe of this kind, there are there's a hunger. You need to bring in doctors, uh, uh, aid. Yes, that's exactly what follows each such catastrophe. That's why so many countries are not just sending in rescue workers, because just as the first phase, which is, of course, crucial, but then there's the second phase. You have to uh, help the injured, uh, to heal people. Uh, you have to, to, you know, follow up on all uh, the catastrophes that are about to uh, unroll in Turkey and in Syria. Of course, in Syria, it's, it's more complicated, as Doug has been saying. How will they be able to get all that aid into uh, some of these regions? That's a question they'll have to resolve. And finally, Doug, uh, I, uh, in Ankara, uh, Jasper had touched on this, but there is an election coming up in yeah. Turkey in a few months. Um, I imagine that this is going to play a huge role in that. Uh, what is Erdogan thinking right now? Yeah, look, I mean, obviously this perhaps isn't the time and place to start, you know, going into uh, crunching politics and, and his presidential ambitions. But, but it's probably going but to change his response. You're, you're absolutely... 
Charlie, you're absolutely right. What it's immediately going to do for Erdogan is he is going to uh, get some uh, free get-out-of-jail-free chips, if you will, and that is in the sense of the goodwill from the international community. You know, his adversaries, those who uh, perhaps had some ill will <laughs> towards him, uh, are now going to be in more of a posture of wanting to help out. Earthquakes and, and natural disasters of this kind tend to do that. They do sort of, you know, uh, tear down a lot of the barriers to cooperation, to helping. So basic human sympathy we like to hope, at times like this, intervenes and overrides uh, the political animosities and hostilities. Obviously, we know Erdogan has been a, a, a tough partner uh, for his NATO allies, for a lot of people in the West. Um, but look, we've seen in a lot of instances, whether it's famine in North Korea, um, whether it's sometimes a disaster in, in China, adversaries in times like this tend to come to the aid, uh, you know, of, of people in need. So that is the hope right now for Erdogan. Now, whether or not he tend, he, he's going to try to cynically play off of that to try to, you know, while everyone is watching, you know, has their eyes off, uh, off of his uh, political malfeasance and, and his misdoings, uh, you know, Know, he'll get the sympathy of the international community, and that will help him ultimately at the polls. I would like to think that that's not something that is uh, foremost in his mind uh, today. I think genuinely, um, you know, whatever you think of Erdogan, uh, no no leader of any country likes to deal have to face national tragedies, and you'd like to think that there's a certain uh, you know repository of human compassion, and that he really is desperate in hoping that he'll get the help he needs beyond simply for merely political reasons uh, for his presidential uh, hopes uh, in May. Mm -hmm. uh, International Affairs commentator Douglas Herbert, Shirley Sitbaum from Our Science Desk, thank you both for helping us understand this really terrible story. We're going to take a short break, and then I'll be back in just a couple minutes with the latest from Turkey and Syria.